to chapter two of Les Miserables, translated by Isabel F. Hapgood. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Melissa. Les Miserables by Victor Hugo. Book two, The Fall. Chapter two. Prudence Counsel to Wisdom That evening the Bishop of Denya, after his promenade through the town, remained shut up rather late in his room. He was busy over a great work on duties, which was never completed, unfortunately. He was carefully compiling everything that the fathers and the doctors have said on this important subject. His book was divided into two parts firstly the duties of all and secondly the duties of each individual according to the class to which he belongs the duties of all are the great duties there are four of these st matthew points them out duties toward god matthew six duties towards oneself matthew five twenty nine and thirty duties towards one neighbor matthew seven Twelve. Duties towards animals, Matthew six twenty and twenty five. As for the other duties, the bishop found them pointed out and prescribed elsewhere, to sovereigns and subjects in the epistles to the Romans, to magistrates, to wives, to mothers, to young men, by Saint Peter, to husbands, fathers, children, and servants, in the epistles to the Ephesians to the faithful in the epistles of the hebrews to virgins in the epistle to the corinthians out of these precepts he was laboriously constructing a harmonious whole which he desired to present to souls at eight o'clock he was still at work writing with a good deal of inconvenience upon little squares of paper with a big book open on his knees when madame magliori entered according to her wont to get the silverware from the cupboard near his bed. A moment later the bishop, knowing that the table was set, and that his sister was probably waiting for him, shut his book, rose from his table, and entered the dining-room. The dining-room was an oblong apartment with a fireplace, which had a door opening on the street, as we have said, and a window opening on the garden. Madame Magliori was, in fact, just putting the last touches to the table. As she performed the service, she was conversing with Mademoiselle Baptistine. A lamp stood on the table. The table was near the fireplace. A wood fire was burning there. One can easily picture to oneself these two women, both of whom were over sixty years of age. Madame Magliori, small, plump, vivacious. Mademoiselle Baptistine, gentle, slender, frail, somewhat taller than her brother, dressed in a gown of puce-colored silk, of the fashion of 1806, which she had purchased at that date in Paris, and which had lasted ever since. To borrow vulgar phrases, which possess the merit of giving utterance in a single word, to an idea which a whole page would hardly suffice to express, Madame Magliori had the air of a peasant, and Mademoiselle Baptistine that of a lady. Madame Magliori wore a white quilted cap, a gold genette cross on a velvet ribbon upon her neck, the only bit of feminine jewelry that there was in the house, a very white fichu puffing out from a gown of coarse black woolen stuff, with large short sleeves, an apron of cotton cloth and red and green checks, knotted round the waist with a green ribbon, with a stomacher of the same attached by two pins at the upper corners, coarse shoes on her feet, and yellow stockings, like the women of Marseilles. Mademoiselle Baptistine's gown was cut on the patterns of 1806, with a short waist, a narrow sheath-like skirt, puffed sleeves with flaps and buttons. She concealed her gray hair under a frizzed wig known as the baby wig. Madame Magliori had an intelligent, vivacious, and kindly air, 
the two corners of her mouth unequally raised, and her upper lip, which was larger than the lower, imparted to her a rather crabbed and imperious look. So long as Monseigneur held his peace, she talked to him resolutely with a mixture of respect and freedom. But as soon as Monseigneur began to speak, as we have seen, she obeyed passively like her mistress. Mademoiselle Baptistine did not even speak. She confined herself to obeying and pleasing him. She had never been pretty, even when she was young. She had large, blue, prominent eyes, and a long, arched nose. But her whole visage, her whole person, breathed forth in an ineffable goodness, as we have stated in the beginning. She had always been predestined to gentleness. But faith, charity, hope, those three virtues which mildly warm the soul, had gradually elevated that gentleness to sanctity. Nature had made her a lamb. Religion had made her an angel. Poor sainted virgin, sweet memory which has vanished. Mademoiselle Baptistine has so often narrated what passed at the Episcopal residence that evening, that there are many people now living who still recall the most minute details. At the moment when the bishop entered, Madame Magliore was talking with considerable vivacity. She was haranguing Mademoiselle Baptistine on a subject which was familiar to her, and to which the bishop was also accustomed. The question concerned the lock upon the entrance door. It appears that while procuring some provisions for supper, Madame Magliore had heard things in divers places. People had spoken of a prowler of evil appearance. A suspicious vagabond had arrived, who must be somewhere about the town, and those who should take into their heads to return home late that night might be subjected to unpleasant encounters. The police was very badly organized, moreover, because there was no love lost between the prefect and the mayor, who sought to injure each other by making things happen. It behooved wise people to play the part of their own police, and to guard themselves well, and care must be taken to duly close, bar, and barricade their houses, and to fasten the doors well. Madame Magliore emphasized these last words. But the bishop had just come from his room, where it was rather cold. He seated himself in front of the fire, and warmed himself, and then fell to thinking of other things. He did not take up the remark dropped with design by Madame Magliore. She repeated it. Then Mademoiselle Baptistine, desirous of satisfying Madame Magliore, without displeasing her brother, ventured to say timidly, "'Did you hear what Madame Magliore is saying, brother?' "'I have heard something of it in a vague way,' replied the bishop. Then, half turning in his chair, placing his hands on his knees, and raising towards the old servant-woman his cordial face, which so easily grew joyous, and which was illuminated from below by the firelight. Come, what is the matter? What is the matter? Are we in any great danger? Then Madame Magliore began the whole story afresh, exaggerating it a little, without being aware of the fact. It appeared that a bohemian, a barefooted vagabond, a sort of dangerous mendicant, was at that moment in the town. He had presented himself at Jacquin Le Bair's to obtain lodgings, but the latter had not been willing to take him in. He had been seen to arrive by the way of the Boulevard Gassendi, and roam about the streets in the gloaming, a gallows bird with a terrible face. Really, said the bishop. This willingness to interrogate encouraged Madame Magliore. It seemed to her to indicate that the bishop was on the point of becoming alarmed. She pursued triumphantly. Yes, Monseigneur, that is how it is. There will be some sort of catastrophe in this town tonight. Everyone says so. And withal, the police is so badly regulated. A useful repetition. The idea of living in a mountainous country, and not even having lights in the streets at night. One goes out. Black as ovens, indeed. And I say, Monseigneur, and Mademoiselle there says with me. I, interrupted his sister, say nothing. What my brother does is well done. Madame Magliore continued as though there had been no protest. We say that this house is not safe at all, that if Monseigneur will permit, I will go and tell Paulin Musbois, 
the locksmith, to come and replace the ancient locks on the door. We have them, and it is only the word of a moment, for I say that nothing is more terrible than a door which can be opened from the outside with a latch for the first passer-by, and I say that we need bolts, Monseigneur, if only for this night. Moreover, Monseigneur has the habit of always saying, Come in! And besides, even in the middle of the night, Oh, mon Dieu, there is no need to ask permission. At that moment there came a tolerably violent knock on the door. Come in, said the bishop. End of Book Two, Chapter Two Recording by Melissa.